Plenary 2020. In keeping with the theme of the weekend, of convergence, of convergence of different kinds of communities, different styles of music, recognizing the power inherent in collaborating and coming together at a time of political crisis in our country. Uh, we just, we thought it would be good to dedicate an hour to a conversation with four extraordinary artists, activists, and a really amazing um, moderator. I want to just give you a word about Tai, rap poet, also known as Self Suffice, and then I'm going to turn it over to his very capable hands. Um, Kaim is a craftsman of the utmost degree, shaping lyrics um, with important social meanings. He's uh, toured widely, lectured both in universities and done workshops with youth. He was honored by President Obama for his outstanding work in promoting social consciousness among inner city youth. Um, he's produced with some of the best of them, and I think the uh, wisdom and uh, energy of his spirit will come forth as you hear, hear him. Here's Kaim. Keep your hands clapping for Irwin. He put a lot of intentionality into this and a lot of sleepless nights. Thank you, Irwin, for having us. So, first of all, I'd like to introduce um, Pauline Fasano, thank you, really. Throw that up. Pauline Fasano is a coordinator at right here in the middle. She's a coordinator at the Poor People's Campaign and a cross movement cultural arts incubator supervisor. Um, running out of the People's Forum. Who was there last night? The People's Forum. She runs the program out of there, um, which is beautiful to see. Like, if you miss that, it's hard to put into words. But she's also really concerned with projects that provide alternatives to mental health being all through pharmacology and medicine, right? We know about that through music and activism and getting out of bed. Um, and she's also working on a climate change concept album musical. So that's Pauline right there. Right. Moving right along, um, Bob Law is uh, probably almost here. And he is, uh, but he could be anywhere because he has an international following. He's a broadcaster at WBAI from the streets a popular program a lot of us are familiar with. Um, he features a lot of black and progressive political and cultural figures, and um, his documentary, Say It Loud, speaks to the state of black radio and independent voices within black radio. Um, he's also the chairman of the National Black Leadership Organization. So, Bob, if you can hear us clapping, come to the stage now. <laughs> Joseph Hernandez is a genre emerging beat making, spoken wording, rapping, engineering, mixing, mastering. He's also one of the people that led the hip hop track and was just running his own things while supporting other people. Um, but he does this. He has a certificate from the Institute of Audio Research as well. His work has taken him to Haiti, India, um, working in the public schools through Urban Arts Beat. Everyone who's like in hip hop EDU in New York, you know of Urban Arts Beat. And I'm not even New York, and I know of Urban Arts Beat. Um, but also, he's an he's a incarcerated youth advocate for 16 to 21 year old youth. So that's Dilson Hernandez, please. Um, and of course, we have Elise Ryan who will be leaving a little bit earlier, so we got, she, we got to want to be pulling her. Don't take it personal. She's going to be like, bye, y'all. I got to go. She got to catch a train at around 4.20, um, But she's a labor movement, uh, labor movement educator, organizer, artist. Uh, she was a bargaining unit chair at the National Labor College. Um, she retired from her professorship at the National Labor College to start her own consulting service. Go ahead, Elise. And she's the executive director of the Labor Heritage Foundation. Um, she also founded the DC Labor Chorus, directed a couple of uh, jazz operas, including Forgotten. And she received the Lifetime Achievement Award for the United Association of Labor Educators. So, you see why we put her last, right? 
We all out here trying to get a Lifetime Achievement Award. I want to have everybody do something with me collectively right now. I just want you to hold your breath and breathe out. And just remember to do that throughout this plenary, you know, at any time. It's not disruptive to anybody to breathe as slow or quick or hold. But a lot of times when we talk about breathing, we forget the hold in between. So I just want us to all hold space for people who aren't in this room, for thoughts that won't be said on this microphone or at this table that are still here and still as relevant as anything that we do visibly see. Um, these bios should really be read, so if you have your program, this I just highlighted things from them, but you should really read through their uh, bios and connect because that's what's great about this community, right? The superstars are right next to you wanting to connect with you, all right? So please read their bios, and I apologize for only taking the highlights from your bios. Um, also, I want to say these conversations are really like affirmations that we all are brilliant and that we all are creative, and we all are confident, and we all are doing this work and have allies who are not always in this room, right? Like, I've met Dilson before, this is my first time meeting Pauline and my first time meeting Elise, but I'm, I was in DC a couple weeks ago, you know, I was talking to somebody who's telling me about you. Um, so, that's what this is about. This isn't, we're not gonna be asking questions about like, so do you really think art matters and is active? In? That's not this crowd. We're going to cut through this. They're not explaining for people who don't get it. This is a space to have conversations with people who already are all doing this, okay? So this is as much for us just to take a collective breath and know you're not crazy. And even though you don't see everyone in this room on a daily basis, we're out here doing the same thing that you're doing, okay? Um, so give yourself a round of applause. So, we're going to start right into the future. I figure that's one thing that artists do better than any other sector, is that we can put ourselves in the future and lead while other people are waiting for like the facts and figures and the reasons and the approval. Artists just say, this is where we're going, all right? Um, the first question I'm going to start with about the future is, do you have to be more captivating? Um, do you see yourself, in what way do you see yourself um, answering that question of do I have to be more captivating with my art in service to my message reaching more people? Do you see yourself growing or is it just like art is cool, I did it, or is this like a commitment that you see yourself? Where do you see yourself with that in the future? Becoming even more of an artist or saying I had to give up this art thing because I'm so righteous? <laughs> I'm not giving up nothing. I'm taking it all. And um, I have always, uh, and, and as was expected in my life, it was going to work. And so I am a worker, artist, a culture worker. And I am so excited about the future. Because I, I, I being at the Women's March um, a couple weeks ago, and also being at the uh, Parkland Student March, against violence, gun violence, march, and to see those young people, you know, and I, I, way more articulate than I was at the age of 17 or 18 years old, but also in the streets, but not just individuals, but families are out. I mean, families, whole, in that, families of, of different cultural backgrounds are marching in the streets. People who I know wouldn't ever march again. And that's the future. And, and the way they painted the millennials of being this, you know, like thumb pressing, you know, cell phone of self, selfie, addicted, is just, you know, one part of it. But there are some folks who are doing some really serious work, so honoring well the traditions that started before us. Yeah. 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 Thank you. He's just taking off his jacket, you know, yeah. dusting his shoulders off. When we, uh, when we were, when I heard you frame it about talking about the future first, I was reminded of a quote by Gloria Anzaldúa. Um, Nothing happens in the real world unless it first happens in the images in our heads. And so I thought to myself, that's really, and she's amazing, Borderlands La Frontera, she's an um, amazing author. And um, 
it just made me think that that's the role of the artist, is to really make imagination possible, and to really push the, hi, Bob. <laughs> um, and to really push the envelope uh, in that way. And so, in that way, the images in our head need to be compelling. Um, I do have a lot of hope for what's happening, but there is a um, ticking clock, I think, also, um, in, in, in um, many ways. And so I just think that the goal is to really collectively come up with a very compelling argument for a way to restructure how we look at each other in our systems. And so um, as compelling as we can make that in our art, um, as welcoming as we can make that, as we can organize artists to be organizers and organizers to be artists, um, and to break out of this thought that an artist is one person, it's, we've compartmentalized our creative thought process and so if we can find a way to reinvigorate imagination with everybody, um, then that's really the task at hand. Um, and I was really moved by seeing the children on stage because they're our future, singing yeah. their imagination well, we're too. While still on, on you, um, you, you do work to motivate other people, a lot of different projects, right? Um, what is it about people's agency as artists? Because there's often this idea that like, Oh, I'm an artist, I don't do politics, and there's this other idea that like everything's political. So you saying you don't do politics is a strong political statement about how you can be manipulated. But then again, like you've seen with presidents like you showed earlier, NWA and Dilson's uh, Luke, right? People were saying raunchy, ridiculous things, but then they followed through in the court system to give us rights um, and to say, when I say I'm conscious, does that mean white people now get to pigeonhole me to be conscious in a certain way? How do we make artists aware of their agency um, without setting them up for another trap, another form of manipulation to do respectability politics, to do what they're being told to stay in your place? That's a really big question, and I'm trying to actively answer it, hopefully with community. Um, because I can't all of a sudden be king and tell my artist friends that don't have a political container um, what they must do. Um, I can just do my best to invite them in to the circle. And so I think here in this country there's a lot of class and race analysis and consciousness that needs to happen and that can only happen in community. And so to try to create spaces where people come in and find their own consciousness in ways that I'm still figuring out myself. It's a constant evolution. I don't know if that answers the question, but it's a big question. Thank you. Yeah. Let's continue with this. And your vision, where you see yourself in the future and along those lines, calling yourself to agency and freedom at the same time. You mentioned something about artists having that captivating spirit. Um, as an artist, I feel like that is an absolute must. I mean, if you, if you don't have the captivating like essence in your art, um, it's kind of slow for you. <laughs> so I feel like um, it's it, it's super important for me to like keep reinventing what I perceive as art, but also sh like spreading that spark, like not just holding it on for yourself and just keeping it to you, like igniting that fire, especially with with youth, is super important. So that that could keep passing on and on. Um, eventually, I do kind of seem like when I get older, see myself taking a step back kind of from the music, if, if I'm being honest, or the art, and involve myself more like community-based spaces and knowing how to build community in the Bronx, specifically. Um, I kind of just came to that realization now because um, just thinking in the ahead in the future, I've never been one to like fully plan out where am I going to be 20, 30, 40 years from now for um, other reasons, but... And, and we've already seen that. We've already started to see you doing a workshop and saying, you know what, I'm going to give my place up to give this person. That's that type of thing where you can step in, but you see the bigger role, too. Now you can perform, but you can also facilitate other people, right? Um, so, Bob, we're on the future segment right now, and we're saying, I gave you an amazing introduction, by the way. Amazing! <laughs> They were clapping so loud that we were thinking you would hear it on your way here. Hopefully you did. Just wink if you did. Don't say anything if you did. But um, Bob, same question on the future. Artists are the, are the one segment that can just go to the future. We don't need the facts. We don't need the figures. We say this is where we're going 
and everyone else, um, we want y'all to figure it out. We want y'all to catch up to it. Where do you see yourself in the future? And, and do you see yourself saying, I give up on art because I'm so righteous? Or, or do you see yourself continuing to further your art, your broadcasting, your communication in service of, in service of the mission, the prize? Well, I didn't hear the introduction, but I understand that it was wonderful. <laughs> and couldn't possibly be true. <laughs> but I thank you for the rumor. It was a fraction of the truth. Coming out of the Black Arts Movement of the 1960s, we spent some time talking about the role of artists. And, and it is our position that the artists and the activists are all the same. You don't get separated from your political responsibility because of what you do, not because of your occupation or your avocation, you are, uh, to, to respond to your question, I think that first, an artist has to define themselves. One of the ways that artists are not manipulated by other forces is if the artist is clear themselves who they are, what they represent. They have to define themselves and they have to do the study. They've got to uh, experience other artists. They've got to include in their life other experiences in order to be able to fully develop their own potential that's in, already invested in them. I think that the uh, uh, art, I mean, I heard what everybody else said, and, and all I can say to that is amen. <laughs> that is, all of that is correct. Uh, art, at the center of art is the principle of discovery. This is what this brother said. I want to discover more. That's what John Coltrane said that he was trying to discover everything else he could do with the music, with the notes, and, and listening to music from around the world. He was able to incorporate, and, and artists do that, and incorporate the ideas and the, and the stimuli from that globally, and incorporate it in what they do. My concern is that there is an art form developing here that is limited to experiences here on the street only. It does not include the music that comes out of South Africa, Leila and the song, so, uh, Something Inside So Strong. You know, it doesn't include the music of, of, of uh, uh, I forgot the brother's name, Donald Lawrence. There, there's, there's a king in you. You know, there's a lot of music. There's, there's uh, new music by Kurt Whalen, who's redone the song, We Shall Overcome. And, it's Eddie, and, and he says now, We Shall Overcome You and get that through your head. Uh, and, and that is taking it further. That is uh, what the artist does. They, they discover what else there is to express. And so uh, I think that trying to respond to your question, I think the artist protects themselves from manipulation by defining themselves and being confident about who they are, what they do, and understanding, see that an art doesn't help you reflect reality. It's not the function of art or an artist. You know, there are artists who say, I'm just keeping it real. You don't need them to keep it real. real reality is already there, and, and the reality is part of the problem. What art does is help you envision the new reality. See, art ought to help you to, to envision what you can be, not simply reflect what you are. There you go. Thank you. Round one. The crowd is excited. It's heating up. I'm going to ask one more question before we go on to the um, next part. We're going to stay in the future for a second. Um, Dilson, I know you work with this a lot in, in advocating for incarcerated youth and, and in the schools. and um, Everyone up here does to a degree. But um, young people are being exposed to art and given definitions and words of art that are very limiting at an earlier age and with a lot of flashy professional devices and colors right now. Like you said, it's part truth, right? It's not the whole truth, but that is part of the truth. They're being spurred earlier, and I as a, a grown man, a, a husband, a parent, a brother, all these things I am, am still learning that a lot of times when there's someone in my life that I'm really having problems with, I'm taking on their problems, and if I did know myself, and my name is Self Suffice, that's like my rap, right? But I'm still realizing this every day more. 
it's obviously a challenge for young people, right? They're getting told what rap is, what their culture is, what blackness is, and I don't think it's per se. Like, you see a lot of Afrobeat, you're actually seeing a lot of young people embracing African culture more than ever before because of this global thing. But again, it's often through a white commercialist, materialist lens, and that still becomes an issue. So how do we see this um, taking place in the future, where we're not just exposing young to more opportunities, but we're returning our youth to the intergenerational lens of their parents and grandparents in their community? I think first you have to, First, you have to really, I mean, it's like everything else that starts in, in, the, in the home, right? So as parents, as uncles, as aunts, as older folks, so to speak, we have to pass that knowledge on because they're not going to learn that in public schools, not even charters. In, in any type of schooling system that we have in this country, I don't really see it happening. So we as family members, as, as brothers, sisters, whatever it may, may be, have to pass on that knowledge and tell them this is our history, this is what you've been given via this phone, and actually hold space for conversation and not be this like, well let me tell you about this concert, like actually listen to them too. Like, so there has to be a balance of like, this is like, this is what I think is going on in your life and this is what you've been given and you, what I, 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 I don't, I don't want to say you're programmed, but just like, we all have a tendency of being programmed through this, this right here, right? But still giving them the, the opportunity to open up and being like, how, why are you attracted to this music one? Why are you attracted to this culture, this lifestyle? Like, explain to me, because I don't see why. And it could be very de detrimental to not only yourself, but just us as a whole. So tell me why you're attracted to that. Listening yeah. is f so important when it comes to youth, especially th this type of job. and. The demographic that I deal with, I feel like often don't feel like they're being heard at all. They're just constant shutdown, always like older folks trying to point their finger at them and telling them this, this, and that. So I think um, listening is super, super it's like a, It's like a conversation. Even the phone becomes a tool then. Rather than Google the right answer so that you're right or wrong, it's like we can use that phone in our conversation. But this is a conversation we're having. It's not a right answer. Right. It's, it's not you me connecting. telling you you're wrong, and this is why you're bugging out. Like, it's, you tell me what you think, I tell you what I think, let's find a medium because you're subtle. important to me. I feel it's like. subtle but so powerful. Yeah. Let's continue. <laughs> oh, okay, is that, is that, you wanna say more? Um, yeah, so, uh, Kind of what I heard too in the question is that I think um, maybe this will go into talking about the past, but I think that we have to be very aware that stories that are told are from an imperialist lens. So I'm thinking about um, uh, one of the characters in the musical um, that I'm working on is Yaya Rona, um, and so she's an anti-imperialist hero. She stood up to a king in a way that no one else did, but there was a Hollywood movie made in April of last year um, that completely vilified her. And so it's really important that when we think about these stories that we're coming from, we, um, to always just encourage the interrogation of what is considered the norm, what is considered like a given thing, and remember that we are in an imperialist, colonized, militarized community. And so that is therefore the overlying lens that all these stories are coming from. Um, and then to also get in inward and interrogate yourself um, when you have those analyses too. So that's a little thing I wanted to... So by default, by default saying, there's gonna be a part for questions. Don't matter how good it sounds, this is part of our process. Yeah. I want you to uh, just consider this. I've been in a number of conversations that say we have to listen and we really have to listen to young people. And, and there's, a, there's a brother with an organization called the Peacekeepers that is out in the street and we walk in the street and we stop and talk to people and he's now got a series called Barbershop Talk mm -hmm. and going into barbershops and talking to people in the barbershops. There's remarkable conversations go on in the barbershop 
anyway, just so come up. <laughs> and so it is, it is a good place for the conversation. However, in all of the meetings in the, I, I've been in, people say, you've got to go get the young people, and you've got to hear them, you've got to listen to them. So we have done that, sitting in the barbershop, sitting in rooms like this, sitting in a place out in Brooklyn called the Word Up Cafe, doing, doing a, uh, uh, what do you call it, with open mic, mic slams. And I've said to young people, but, but your question was really good though, what, what attracts you to this? I don't know if we've said it quite like that. We might have, we might have said, what's up with y'all? <laughs> yeah. It's different, but um, but we did ask. What we what Vivi did ask what what attracts you, and who influences you, and who's important to you. Who do you trust? How do you feel about what's going on in the streets where you live right now? Every time they have said, "I don't know," we thought you knew. I wonder if. The people who are doing the study, the people who are enlightened, you know, the people who are already on the track. That's the people. That's who those people are. They watching us right now. That that is not an official question. You have been rejected. I have no power here. You can use that Siri voice. We know who you are. This is the people's voice. <laughs> but yeah, the, so the people who are doing the study may have to take the leadership initiative. So it, it, let us benefit from what you know. There are young people who will listen to you because you are closer to their age. But I have discovered that there are young people who will listen to me as well. And I'm not nearly close to their age. <laughs> but. Uh, I, I want you just to consider that the people who are already reaching higher in their own mind and already are operating at a important level of consciousness might need to take the leadership initiative and take a message to young people. They are, I, my experience has been that they are willing to accept it. They're willing to hear it. Uh, and it is very important how you talk to them. Uh, that, that really is important, and, and many of us know that, and we, and we really do talk to them in, in a respectful manner. We also require that they talk to us in a respectful manner. But, but that was it. Just, just consider that you already know. Um, you know, you heard the, the Buddhist story of, uh, of the man who had heard about fire, and, and he had heard that food tastes better when it's cooked. You know, it's, and, and so he was going out to find fire. And he was looking and walking around with a torch, looking for fire. <laughs> and the Buddhists like to point out that if he had known what fire was, he could have cooked his rice much sooner. What about the people who know what fire is, going out among the people who do not, as opposed to waiting for the people who do not to come and tell us what their concerns are, where their confusion is. They are very much confused, as you point out. There's a, a very sophisticated, uh, manipulative process of disseminating imperialistic information from an imperialist lens. It's absolutely true. You understand that. The kid in the street does not. So you might need to go to I have so many and, memories of the teach. Socratic method in school where a teacher might say to a group of white kids where there's one black kid, so, you know, you all did this homework on welfare. How does welfare work? And none of them did the homework. So they talk about how black people are welfare and they get the statistics all wrong. And the professor sits there and allows this to happen because it's a healthy Socratic debate. It's not, right? Any, any tool that can be used for freedom can be used for slavery as well. So it sounds like we all have a vision of conversations here. We all have a vision of um, listening with leadership, right? I'm going to listen. That doesn't mean I don't know anything. The first, the first oppression we learn is to be seen and not heard. Right? Children should be seen and not heard. And that gets repeated over and over in, in many, many, many ways. And when I think about if I could change one thing, and, and I, I, it's not over yet, so it might 
happened is when we gave up camps for kids. The camps were summer camps where folks would come and learn their history and their culture and the history and culture that's not taught in the schools and a place on the earth, in the earth, um, so they're out of the city, right, and, and on the land. Uh, that's what I would do again because I think that I, I, I'm never married, I have no children of my own, but the, when I see my legacy and I have hope is the students I have who have gone on and have done those things. And so I, I want to get back to that training. And I have to thank Lucy Murphy because Lucy Murphy has done more to bring more young folks, well, folks, more young folks, folks other than 50, 50 years and under, to the DC Labor Course and people of color than anybody else in the course, single-handedly. She does that. She does it. She's active. She's active. And she's engaged. So I think, you know, each one bring one. And because and I'm getting ready to run out the door, is that this, this is what I really hold to be true. Um, uh, I was in Nicaragua. It was right after the hurricanes and the earthquake. And we were driving back, and a, a truck full of people who were um, going back to the camp spilled over, and bodies were all over the road. And it was just, it was terrible. I'd never seen anything like it. And we people got out of our van and they were helping. And the mayor of, the, of our sister city uh, started pe putting people in his jeep and he was driving them away to the, um, to the hospital, which was 30 miles away. And so we, we pushed on in the rain and the potholes. We knew we know what was going on. We got back to the hotel. We were all depressed, we're like, oh God, what are we going to do? And Mayor Rito, after taking people to the hospital, came back and he walked in the door with his arms full of gifts for us and a mariachi band. And they were playing and it was like, oh my God, the party's on. And so he sat down at the table and said, Mayor Rito, yeah, that's your question. H how do you how do you keep going? How do you how do y'all, you know? And he said, We're not Norte Americanos. We can't afford the luxury of despair. We can't afford the luxury of despair. So when we want to feel like that, uh-uh, that's not the time. We got too much going on. We got too much right on. So we got that next generation of folks that we are listening to but also educating and helping guide, not tell, but guide, because that's what we need. That's what everybody needs. And so I thank you for giving us time, and I'm going to see y'all later. Thank you so much. Lisa, I think you just been tagged on to the table, so if you'd like to make your way up to this chair, the chair is now yours. You just clap them like, how do you realize that? Yeah, you just tagged on to the table. And she just gave Lisa an introduction. Um, I'm, I want to go to, thank you. <laughs> so, um, it is MLK Day season. Um, it's about to be Black History Month. A number of us get a lot more calls this time of year for some reason. Uh, and it's not February, it's not us changing, but um, Keeping that in mind of like figureheads and season and marketing of things, MLK has kind of become um, to speak to kids' points, right? Like when we're talking to kids and they already expect a certain conversation for us. So they're saying, I don't know, but maybe they're also saying, you don't really want to know. Like you're asking me with this agenda. MLK, we always hear about the peace and we know a lot of people in this room, there are people like Stokely Carmichael, um, Kwame Ture, who we're pushing for MLK to speak out against the Vietnam War. He made a speech in 67 against the war, um, and many people were waiting for him to do that. And he even said in his speech, like, it's contradictory not to see these two things. But predictably, a whole bunch of his followers, it's almost like Instagram from back in the days, right? These followers, but they measured the statistics, a whole bunch of the followers of people that believed in his message were turned off that how could you support anti-Vietnam and be for civil rights as anti-American. And everyone here in the room realizes how ridiculous that is. In a sense, we're in a similar time, right? We're always up against similar things, but with a president in between this impeachment thing, trying to say we're going to war again, and are you going to be a patriot and forget about me? Um, I want to play this clip because there's another clip where Martin Luther King says something that even though it was said decades ago, it's still not being told in the narrative of MLK. And it really explains a lot of what this is, right? We can't just say in the poor people's campaign, in the people's movements, we're not just saying we don't understand money and don't have anything to do with it. We're saying we're in solidarity with people who are adversely affected by it. 
but uh, we're not delusional about it. So I thought this was something that um, we're going to reflect on. Yes, right there in the middle. The very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land, through an act of Congress, our government was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest. But not only did they give the land, they built land-grant colleges with government money to teach them how to farm. Not only that, they provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. Not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they could mechanize their farm. Not only that, Today, many of these people are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidies not to farm, and they are the very people telling the black man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstrap. So that's MLK right there. And, and you know Malcolm, MLK, they were all so young when they were assassinated, you know? Just imagine. So let's, let's go back into this question. Looking back in the past, what have we learned about some of our own delusional nature when we when we say be positive or be any of these words can be used against us right how have we learned to have these conversations in ways where we're aware what we're telling people um can be taken out of context and we need to make sure they get these particular parts that don't always feel good and require a little bit more research for you to be involved with. I mean, we'll start with two weeks. I have to say something that, is, uh, that has been on my heart because I remember the uh, Poor People's Campaign of 1968. That was my last year of high school. And in the, the years that have passed, um, we have become so separated. I mean, the people who have sympathy for the poor really don't have much idea of what real poor people are going through. So now we are tasked with the, um, with the job of reorganizing a new poor people's campaign because almost half the country is in poverty. But, you know, too many people are still watching television and still <coughs> tripped out uh, so that we don't have uh, essential things like transportation to get poor people to the place where they need to be to organize themselves uh, together. Uh, we used to understand that. We used to pick people up and take them to meetings. Uh, but now we think they've got Uber and, and Lyft. And maybe they don't have a phone that does Uber and Lyft, and maybe they don't have two dollars or what is it in in uh, New York two dollars and seventy five cents to go one way, which means you have to have six dollars to go two ways. And you know uh, we we've got a, a movement that's top heavy with clerics and academics who have become disengaged. I mean they may their hearts may be in a good place but they really don't understand the real situation of a lot of people. And I know that some of my musician friends understand because you've been in those situations where you had $2.25 and you had to get on the train and it was $2.75 and uh, maybe you jumped the gate or something and then you had to deal with something else. But anyway, uh, we really Now they're making them so you can't jump the gate. They ain't even giving you a chance to get arrested. <laughs> if you're little, you can go under the air. But anyway, some, You'll find some, a, way. a lot of us are too big. Um, anyway, but we do have to organize uh, transportation, and we have to understand that everybody's not texting and emailing, uh, that uh, we have to use the telephone and have real conversations and face-to-face -face conversations, which seems that people are afraid to do because we've gotten so afraid of each other. Mm -hmm. That's all, that's all my heart, that's all I got. Pauline, I would love to hear from everybody on this because this is really referring to the past as we go forward. It's a way to show gratitude to our past and to the people that came before us, to not 
make the same mistakes and to honor what they've learned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Let, me, let me ask you specifically. Yeah. I see a lot of people these days starting movements for the first time. Mm -hmm. because it's a trend on Twitter. It's a new hashtag. Mm -hmm. And every one of these is something that's been done over and over again decades ago. And it's great to see people enthusiastic about this new hashtag. But it's delusional for them because they think they're starting from scratch. How do we encourage you to pick up that mm -hmm. banner but also say, you know, someone's been working on this for 50 years. Check in with them so you so we can progress together. Yeah, I think that there's a real responsibility to do that homework, for sure, to see who's already doing the work, because the work is definitely already being done. And so your, your, your role, my role as an ally in a lot of organizations I'm in, is to do exactly that, is to kind of go and to say, okay, what do you need? And that's what I will do. You know, um, we have a, um, uh, there was an issue in New York City speaking of transportation, about transportation here. And there's a lot of activists right now um, that really want to get involved in um, uh, free public transit, uh, fair evasion practices, and things like that. But there were organizations already doing that work. Right. And so it was basically, I think it was Decolonize This Place and some other organizations were like, hey, hold up, stop. Like, people have already been doing this work. Your role is to actually do that. Because I think at the end of the day, you know, we have this mentality of individualism that I have to fight inside of me all the time. All the, it's exhausting all the time to interrogate that idea to think that you're the one that's going to start that. I'm the one that's going to save the future. Well, you know, I'm in social work school. If I think that I'm going to save the future, I am definitely the problem. You know, because it's, it, it's, not, it's not about that. It's I have to find the people doing the work and saying, what do you need? And, and let's bring more people into this conversation. That's, a, that's how I feel about Thank that. You. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep mine uh, very brief. I had a friend of mine kind of open my eyes to something in the past couple of years. She, she told me um, she's worked for a lot of, you know, a lot of her life she's had this mentality of I want to like fight this, not fight, yeah, I want to go to war with the system. But she has since strayed from that and said, I'm not going to have that mentality anymore. And she's now on the path of what can I do to nurture my community? She's more on the nurturing my people and what do we need rather than like, let me fight and let me be like, have this like militant sort of mindset. Not to say that that's bad, but I think that I've kind of thought about that more <coughs> over the years as well. And I've been trying to discover that. Because I tend to have, even though I'm very calm and I do have a, a nurturing like persona, um, when I see an injustice, like I have this innate like fighter spirit, and I just want to like, it's it's not the best mindset where I where as I could use my nurturing abilities to yes. to feed community rather than like destroy. It. That's what she said. Instead of destroying, 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 I want to build, build, build. So that's something that I always kind of. We can get really compelled to fight this thing and not realize that we're taking our eyes off of the people that are already nourishing, and that's going to be a choice we can make, too. Hello? Yes? Um, I'd like to, uh, I recently read an article about the Martin Luther King that Americans hated, and what basically said was he wanted economic equality. He wanted economic equality, not just integration, not just being in the same room. I mean, Malcolm X mentioned that too. He said everywhere he went in the world, right next to the most wealthy people, it was integrated. Because you saw the poorest people right there who being used to uplift that wealth, right? Adam Powell. Adam Powell. And one of the things that uh, Dr. King tried to make very clear is that what he wanted was justice. And out of justice, all other things would flow. Without justice, economic equality, integration, none of that is going to happen. Not in a meaningful way. But to try to come back to your question, um, I, I think that if, when you put it in the context of what did we learn uh, from our historical experiences, I think that it is important, it's helpful to understand what we call historical consciousness. 
And see, to understand history is to understand that the understanding of history is revitalization at its highest form. So that when you look back at Dr. King and, and look back at what he did as a, in addition to what he said, if you, if, if, you, if you appreciate, you imitate, you be like, you, you, re, you are revitalized by your history. It, it reminds you of your responsibility. It reminds you of what, of the legacies that already exist. And it kind of reminds you of what you are expected to do. It, it, understanding history has to revitalize your spirit. Um, otherwise, it is just a trip down memory lane. And, and so I think that it is important. Uh, I think that's what you all were saying. As in fact, history works for us if we are motivated, revitalized uh, by our history, by our historical experiences, so that they are not in vain. People say things like, I heard someone on another panel said that we don't want um, Sojourner Truth to have lived and died in vain. You know, we don't want Marcus Garvey to have died in vain. But I'm saying, I don't want to have died in vain. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have lived in vain. And so if, if it was important that you understand the contributions that Garvey made, that Malcolm made, we talk about Malcolm all the time. And if you appreciate what Malcolm did and said and understood and what Malcolm taught, then we have a responsibility to act on what he taught. You know, we, have a, we need to be reminded of what our challenges are by our, by our study of history. So a historical consciousness, because see, the historical consciousness then, consciousness then gets passed along from each generation. The, the historical narrative gets passed along from generation to generation. And one of the things that's happened here is that not only is the, the narrative uh, oppressive, but uh, a lot of the struggle, a lot of the history has not been passed along. So we, there are young, you talk about the, in the black community, there are young people who never heard of anybody. They, they never heard of Kwame Torre, Stokely Carmichael. You can ask people, what, what, have you ever heard of SNCC? And most people have not. The historical narrative is not being passed along. So as a result of not having a historical legacy, there's nothing that they can look back to to be inspired as to how they would move forward. But that's what history does. History is to motivate, to lift. It's a platform from which you move forward. So we thank y'all for this space, that I'm, this air that I'm breathing. Um, thank you. I just want a moment of gratitude. Um, we have time for only one last question. Um, as if we needed one. I just, again, am so thankful that everyone is here for your lives, um, for the workshops that I was in today. Y'all all contributed so much. Um, the people speaking as well as the people seated. Yeah, please give yourself a round of applause. Everyone in here is, is a model of what we've been talking about. Leading and listening. You know, if we could take this outside these walls, that would be the solution. I think it's important to recognize, you know, um, I know you do a lot of environmental work. I think it's important to recognize that, like, this world's been here for millions of years, and trees have it figured out, and a lot of animals have it figured out, and a lot of oxygen has it figured out, and we come in with these human egos, and we are always trying to solve these problems that we created, and are creating by trying to solve them. So it's important for me to recognize when I'm in a room like this, that it's not, like we're not here to pass a class or get a degree or get a stamp of approval. We're here to recognize we actually are the solution. There's nothing we have to do. And um, let's maybe be grateful if you choose to, but I choose to be very grateful for all of y'all. And to remind you that when you step outside of this room, we're still out here doing what you're doing. You know, when, when, you, when you choose to fight against that person that's right next to you, just think of us, because we are we in another country, another city, 
right by your side. And we're just not yelling in your ear, beat them up. We're saying, nourish yourself. We over here, right? So my last question is, there was a lot that came up about hip hop. There's a lot that came up about the cell phones and the, and the generational devices, stuff like that. I think often um, this is something that's used against us, right? If you can have infighting, then you don't even have to attack movements. Um, and one of the ways that this infighting, I think, happens is that we have to make an agenda. We have to fight so hard to uh, stop an injustice that if we recognize a young person who's more conscious and activist than Malcolm X and Kwame and everybody put together, well, that young person needs to be invisible because I'm pushing this agenda that we need to teach the youth. So that's a, that's a question that I wouldn't even probably ask a lot of circles, but I ask it to y'all in this crowd and y'all definitely on this panel. How do we make those people outside of our race, class, gender, age group visible when they come up and show the answer right here, right now, and we never met them before. And it's like, oh, you're the answer. You're an example. Let me say that you're an example. Let me salute you. Let me embrace you rather than say, oh, nah, but most of the people in your group don't do that. Because I think that's really how we can get manipulated from within our groups. How do we do that? How do we recognize those people that come in a different form than we were expecting and fighting so hard against, and they come out and I'm here with you? Or can we do that? Is that unrealistic? Um, so my son is teaching uh, high school science for, it's his first year teaching high school and he hasn't really, uh, he, hasn't, is this one? Yes, he hasn't really felt like as a science teacher he should do a lot of social, I mean, he wants to do social justice teaching, but he hasn't really done a lot. And somebody gave him all of these posters of young people who have been engaging in social justice in some form. And he put them all up in his classroom, and he asked the students to, you know, go around and read these posters and pick somebody that they thought looked interesting and spend about 15 minutes Googling them and finding out what they've been doing. And then they had a little discussion in their tables or in their small groups and shared with the other people what they found out about this young person who was being activist. And he said it, it was a really amazing experience for him and for the students, because they sort of suddenly got like, oh, you know, I don't have to just be a student absorbing all this information. I can get out in society and do things. So that, that's one way that, you know, we can reach out to young people is showing them other examples of young people who are doing amazing things. Thank you. So I think that that's our time, right? That that concludes our time, but a perfect example. The solutions are already here. If it's not said on the mic or not even thought of in this moment, it's still there. First, appreciate that. Get out of your ego. Don't try to over explain. Don't try to overwork because that means you're protecting yourself from the people you see every day and not connecting with the people you don't see every day. Make some posters. Make some mental posters. We're out here. We're all here. I love y'all. Let's give everybody a round of applause for being here. Thank you. Do you want to say anything?